You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in the nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Friday the 8th of February. Britain will leave 3,000 military vehicles worth £2 billion behind. Britain's now the migrant magnet of Europe. Free fruit and vegetables, even the rich, are queuing up in Greece. 30,000 circumcised women in the Netherlands. Nick Griffin, MEP, from the belly of the beast. Syrian and Coptic Christians fleeing to Moscow. Timbuktu, the women are singled out for persecution. Thought for the day, puppets on a string. And finally, Fabio, he wasn't. UK News. When we pull out of Afghanistan, Britain will leave 3,000 military vehicles worth £2 billion behind on the front line. Around 40% of hardware, including up to 1,200 protective trucks and personnel carriers, will be scrapped, sold or given away by the Ministry of Defence. Military chiefs are preparing to bring home 6,500 containers of kit from the front line. But some 4,500 loads will remain in the war zone. Some equipment will be gifted to the Afghan National Army and police so they can maintain security when the UK leaves in December 2014. Other pieces of kit deemed surplus to requirement will be destroyed so it doesn't fall into the hands of insurgents. But the planning assumptions revealed by the MOD have fueled concern that sensitive equipment could inadvertently fall into the Taliban's clutches. Britain is now the migrant magnet of Europe. 600,000 come here in one year, twice as many as go to France, EU officials revealed yesterday. The highest total recorded, 590,950, came to live here in 2010, their figures showed. This intake was more than twice the 251,159 migrants who opted to go to France. It means that this country has overtaken Spain and Germany, where levels fell sharply, as the top target of immigrants seeking jobs and a new home. The rise in numbers coming here marks a historic immigration landmark and comes as a new wave of incomers from Romania and Bulgaria is expected in 2014. CNN reports Muslim Sharia patrols now spreading from Britain to Denmark and Belgium and Spain. And they wonder why there is a white flight away from cities all over Europe with large Muslim populations. In Spain, the Sharia patrols are not only harassing and intimidating non-Muslims, they are also poisoning dogs belonging to non-Muslims. The CNN reporter keeps emphasising how it's only a tiny minority responsible for this abhorrent behaviour. It's only a tiny minority who are terrorists too, but what is a tiny minority of 1.5 billion? Just 1% is 15 million, not so tiny when you're dealing with Muslim numbers. Man offers to marry teen sex slave. Norwich Crown Court heard that Hamza Ali, who is accused of being part of a gang which allegedly held a girl as a sex slave, offered to marry the 13-year-old and have a baby with her. The astonishing claim, because he, Ali, was desperate to have sex with a teenager, was made by a co-defendant, Surin Udin, during a police interview which was conducted after he, Ali, 38, Mohammed Sheikh, 31, and Abdul Hamid, 46, were arrested following the discovery of a girl at Sheikh's home in Chevalier Street last July. The men all deny offences including trafficking and rape. Udin told police he believed the teenager was aged 17, but was shocked when he found out she was actually 13. The defendants all deny conspiracy to traffic within the UK for sexual exploitation between July 1st and 13th last year. Dawn raids carried out in people smuggling investigation. Nine people have been arrested in London in connection with a crackdown on people smuggling gangs in Britain. UK border agency officers carried out dawn raids on addresses in the capital following a joint investigation with agencies in France and Belgium. Those detained are suspected of being part of an alleged criminal network believed to assist illegal immigrants in their attempts to reach the UK by smuggling them in the back of lorries. Those arrested have not been named. European News 30,000 circumcised women in the Netherlands The Hague. 
An estimated 30,000 women are living in the Netherlands who have suffered genital mutilation by circumcision, according to research by the Farris Knowledge Centre for Immigrants, Refugees and Health, commissioned by the Health Ministry. Most of the girls in the high-risk group come from Somalia and Egypt. They are often circumcised in their home country before their arrival in the Netherlands. At the same time, every year an estimated 40 to 50 girls living in the Netherlands are genitally mutilated, mostly during a visit to their country of origin with their parents. Female genital mutilation is a criminal offence in the Netherlands. If it's carried out on underage girls, it comes under child abuse. The number of circumcised women could be even higher without the present policy of combating circumcision, researchers believe. They advise that this policy should be continued. The criminal law approach to circumcision of girls will be extended, said Health State Secretary Martin Van Rijn in a reaction. Following a legislative amendment, it will be possible to prosecute for carrying out circumcision of girls abroad in our country. Greek Scrabble for food handouts in streets. From Athens. When a group of farmers handed out free fruit and vegetables in front of the Ministry of Agriculture in Athens Wednesday, they couldn't have predicted the ensuing chaos. In just two hours, hordes of hungry Greeks scrabbled to get their share of 50 tonnes of handouts, which led to skirmishes in the streets and comparisons with Nazi-occupied Greece in the Second World War. Families and the unemployed queued up to catch rations given out from vans. Look, an old man gestured on local TV. They're pulling supplies out of the trucks. It's like wartime. My pension is worth 600 euros, said another elderly woman, and me and my three unemployed kids have to live on that. A former electrician said, I've been out of work for three years. I've done everything possible to find a job. A bag of tomatoes and some broccoli will last me and my wife a week. Aside from those Greeks who are open about their newfound poverty, a separate social group called the Kripfotoki is emerging. The Kripfotoki are too embarrassed to even admit to friends that they are poverty-struck, and rather than heading for soup kitchens, they forage for food in dumpsters in the dead of night. In evidence of the fact that the crisis is hitting everyone hard, Georgios Ap Apostolopoulos, former chief of the Athens homeless body, said that well-known artists and even women from rich areas of the city come to get food handouts too. Some pretend that they're collecting food to give to the poor, he said. But a silent form of solidarity is taking shape. Those who can afford it hang baskets of food on their bins for the poor. Europe's future leaders join Gang Rape Club. 45 students of the Bordeaux prestigious Science Po Institute joined Ose Les Masculines, Dare to Choose Masculism, a brazenly sexist club, and eight now face a disciplinary committee today after the club's Facebook vote favouring gang rape. Science's Po alumni include disgraced former IMF Dominique Strauss-Kahn, include all recent French presidents. Jean Petou, a spokesman for the college, said that such sexist behaviour and comments were limited to a handful of idiots who want to make an anti-conformism their religion. Their only aim is to shock. Despite their provocation, he said they will be more likely to be disciplined rather than expelled. We can't throw someone out because they clicked like on a website, he said. However, if the club's founders were tracked down, they could face charges of sexual harassment and distorting the Science Po logo. A World Date reporter states, Sounds like, abhorrent though this is, they're taking a leaf out of the Koran. It happens every day of every week when Muslim gangs rape our young girls in the UK and no one really cares. I now hand you over to Nick Griffin, NEP, from the Belly of the Beast. The big issue in Strasbourg this week was the report on reform of the disastrous common fisheries policy. Since more than half of the EU's waters are in reality traditional British fishing grounds, given away by the Tory paedophile Ted Heath, these were votes of far more relevance to British MEPs than, for example, our colleagues in landlocked Austria or Slovakia. The issue produces for me as a nationalist something of a dilemma, because the EU should not have any jurisdiction whatsoever over British waters, but to take part in the vote is to recognise that at present it does. Should one in fact abstain? After careful thought, the answer has to be no. Since, thanks to Heath and all the trader PMs since, including Thatcher, Major, Blair and the Cabbage Patch Dole now nominally in charge of the government, the EU does decide our fisheries policy. The only choice one has is to try to improve the disastrous set of measures they've had in place up until now, or to sit it out 
and add to the risk that nothing will change. In which case, by the time Britain leaves the EU and we regain control of our fishing grounds, they wouldn't actually contain any fish. So the only rational thing to do is, while rejecting in principle the EU's right to decide on the fate of our fish, to do what can be done in practice to improve the EU decisions. And I'm pleased to tell you, the end result is that the new common fisheries policy is a big improvement on the old one. Although, to be blunt, the only thing that could have been worse would have been filling the North Sea with paraquat. Issues such as the discard system, under which a million tonnes of dead fish have up until now been thrown back into the North Sea alone every year, are now going to be addressed. UKIP voted with typical irresponsibility and what seemed to be a total disregard for environmental considerations and fish. I sometimes wonder if they decide on some of their votes on amendments simply by tossing a coin. Or perhaps, like Lenin, they believe that worse is better. What would their voters think if the BBC hit Nigel with that one? Not that they will, of course, because the Farage is a protected species, with a 365-day-a-year close season for BBC journalists. They can feed him ground bait, but they're not allowed to hook him, let alone start clubbing him around the head with a priest, as they do so regularly try with me. UKIP even abstained on a terrible socialist amendment to give the European Commission powers to impose rules and regulations on Britain's millions of anglers. Naturally, I voted against it, and fortunately, so did a majority of MEPs, so it won't come to pass this time around. But no thanks to Mr Farage. To be fair, it was a different story on the tobacco report. This small proposal contains one of the most dangerous and outrageous proposals to have come past us in the whole parliamentary term. Carefully phrased in the blandest possible Euro speak, this is a cunning plan to deal with the lack of household savings in some parts of the Union, Eastern and Southern Europe in particular. The problem, you see, is that this lack of savings makes it very hard to fund investment in pursuit of recovery in those basket case states. Other countries, hi mum, that's us, on the other hand, have a much higher average household savings rate. I guess you can already see where this one's going. Yes, right in one. Philip Tobacco, a Lib Dem from Belgium, thinks it's a wizard wheeze to design a mechanism whereby various incentives can be used to transfer the private savings of British households to pour down the financial plug hole of countries whose economies are being literally destroyed by their membership of the euro. A wonderfully flexible word, incentives. It can cover all manners of carrots, but also sticks. As I said, UKIP also voted against this proposed EU smash and grab raid on the savings of British households, but the Tories, Lib Dems and Labour all voted for it. Perhaps with Labour it's not surprising, for their traditional voter base is now so crushed by various globalist policies that they have no savings to be stolen in any case. But what about all those socialist bureaucrats on salaries of hundreds of thousands a year? You'd think they might look out for them. And as for the Tories, what the hell were they thinking? Were they thinking at all? Are they actually capable of rational thought? Or has Cameron's electoral death wish, manifested this week by his gay marriage showboating, infected their whole party? I don't know, but I make one prediction. The tobacco proposals will trundle on unnoticed until one day in a few months we see a screaming front page in the Express or Mail. Eurocrats plot raid on our savings exclusive. The first bit will be true, but the exclusive claim will be just another lie because you heard it here first. Talking of the media, I've had a busy week on that front too. The row over the socialist attempt to stop the funding of our alliance of European national movements led to a number of interviews, including with the BBC Politics show, after a press conference that I gave with Front National MEP Bruno Gornisch and Dimitar Stoinov, leader of the Bulgarian National Democratic Party. At the press conference, I challenged the BBC to go beyond their usual anti-BNP smears, and instead alert the British public to the fact that the 30 million euro a year pot for funding European level parties is only the first stage of a plan to impose on electors pan EU party lists, whereby we're forced to vote for a steadily increasing number of MEPs put forward not by our traditional national parties, but on pan European lists, over which the members and activists of national parties do not have even the faintest possibility of influence. The scheme will be another nail in the coffin of representative democracy in Britain. Will the BBC accept my challenge and tell people? If they do, I'll find a hat 
and eat it. I also did interviews, much fairer than the British North, on both Irish radio and with a big press agency in Bulgaria. The latter, I think, expected me to parrot Nigel Farage's rather insulting views of their country. I took a different tack, pointing out that for Bulgaria to lose so many highly skilled and capable workers will not merely be bad for their British counterparts, whose wages will be undercut by privatised health service providers exploiting the newcomers. It will also be a disaster for Bulgaria, a country where gypsies and Muslims are already outbreeding the majority European population, and which really can't afford to lose its brightest and its best to Britain. The power of my Twitter feed was again shown this week when I told my followers about an email sent out by my fellow Northwest MEP, the Tory Right Honourable Robert Atkin. He was peeved to a fact that the withdrawal of Air France from Strasbourg from the 1st of April means that it's no longer possible to get from Manchester to the monthly plenary sessions on the Franco-German border with flights of what he called civilised times. As a result, he said, he would not be coming to any more votes from April onwards. Within minutes of my tweeting about this arrogant petulance and suggesting he drive to work like me and most of our voters, I had calls and emails from several journalists wanting copies of his email and to know a bit more. These I duly provided, although I was later told that, when confronted with the evidence of his outburst, the Right Honourable Gentleman's Office wriggled out of the PR blunder by claiming he was only joking and would still be coming to vote. Well, Robert, it didn't look like a joke to me. Still, if you need a lift, just give me a shout and we can carpool. A lot of our voters have to do it, so get in touch and I'll explain to you how it works. Far more seriously, I was granted a whole 90 seconds this week to speak during a debate on sexual violence against women and children. I was able, as a result, to outline the tragic case of murder grooming victim Charlene Downs and the grotesque farce by which her mum and grandma have both repeatedly been threatened with arrest for taking part in peaceful protests to draw attention to the failures by the police and courts to secure justice for Charlene. I also pointed out that, in discussing sexual violence against women on, in modern Europe, the cowardly political elite are still refusing to mention the giant green elephant in the living room, Islam and its contempt for women and hatred of unbelievers. The resulting exchanges with two outraged deniers of these facts are all online and are, though I say it myself, well worth your having a look at. And finally, I've saved the best bit of news till last. Despite the undemocratic left's campaign to deny our voters representation and support for their views, we received notification yesterday that the Alliance of European National Movements and our newly launched Identity and Traditions Foundation have been granted an increased share of the 2013 funding pot. So we'll be receiving a total of more than 604,000 euros. Which means that I look forward to meeting some of you at events later this year to promote the work of our alliance and our educational foundation. And to watching the anguished wailings and gnashings of teeth from Nick Lowell's, Jerry Gable and all the other grubby little Stalinists who tried and failed to shut us out so that their allies in the Labour and Tory parties could get an even bigger slice of the pie. As Monsieur Gornish would say, bon appétit. Thank you very much, Nick. As ever, very, very interesting. World News Timbuktu, the woman singled out for persecution. David Blair of The Telegraph reports Al-Qaeda and its allies in Timbuktu singled out women for special persecution. For ten months, Timbuktu endured occupation by Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, AQIM, and other extremists. So, Timbuktu's 60,000 inhabitants discovered what it would be like under Al-Qaeda rule. The women were singled out for special persecution, as in the case of a Zahara Abdu Maija. Her crime? A Zahara had committed two offences in Islamist eyes. She sometimes failed to cover her face when venturing out, and most heinously of all, she carried pictures of Western pop stars, notably Celine Dion, on her mobile phone. After stopping her on the street last November, Islamist wind whipped her, then after watching her in late November, she was arrested. On the fourth night of her arrest, five men with covered faces raped her after placing a gun to her head. The following morning they let her go, but the Islamists were not finished with a Zahara's family. When this Islamist gunman fled the French assault two weeks ago, her half-brother Mustafa, 35, celebrated by shouting Viva la France on a street corner, 
and a vengeful fighter shot him dead. Syrian and Coptic Christians are fleeing to Moscow. Refugees from Syria and Egypt are flowing into Moscow to escape the wars and persecution in their home countries. Svetlana Ganeshukina, president of the Civic Assistance Committee, has complained that resources in Moscow are beyond breaking point and unable to deal with the flood of refugees. Just last week, a family of ten Coptic Christians, including a child a few months old, presented themselves at the committee's office. The family were fleeing religious persecution from Islamist groups in Masa Mutra, near the Libyan border. Their problems started when the principal of the local school told them that Christians were no longer welcome in the city. Many activists from the Muslim Brotherhood came to their hometown, putting pressure on the Christians to convert. The family were threatened with death if they did not convert to Islam. The family then sought sanctuary with a local priest, but as the church had been burnt once, the priest didn't want to expose it to a further attack. The Coptic Christians, unlike the Syrians, who have a large support network, have it much worse in Moscow because theirs is a small community. A World Date writer says, It is strange that Christians are fleeing to the former communist bastion rather than seeking relief in the democracies of Europe. Could it be that we in Europe are no longer considered a safe haven for those of the Christian faith? Saudi Arabia's treatment of foreign workers under fire after beheading a Sri Lankan maid. The execution of 24-year-old Rizana Nafik has cast a spotlight on the plight of dozens of migrant workers on death row in Saudi Arabia. More than 45 foreign maids are facing execution on death row in Saudi amid growing international outrage at the treatment of migrant workers. The startling figure emerged after Saudi Arabia beheaded a 24-year-old Sri Lankan domestic worker in the face of appeals for clemency from around the world. In 2012, Saudi Arabia executed at least 69 people, say Human Rights Watch. The previous year it executed at least 79, including five women, says Amnesty International. In Saudi Arabia, a domestic worker facing abuse or exploitation from her employer might run away and then be accused of theft. Victims of rape and sexual assault are at risk of being accused of adultery and fornication. Migrants are also said to struggle to gain access to lawyers and translators, and it is not uncommon, according to Human Rights Watch, for the Saudi authorities to prevent those arrested from contacting their embassies. In many cases, they are subjected to whole trials where they can't understand the proceedings, which are conducted solely in Arabic and without translation. Thought for the day. Puppets on a string. It is good news about the Alliance of European National Movements and our newly launched Identity and Traditions Foundation and the input of more lolly. It's about time that people appreciated the nationalist movement in Europe, even if it is not appreciated in the UK so much. Why? Because not only have our youth for three generations been at the mercy of the New World Order of the Frankfurt School of Indoctrination in their educational systems and universities, but also that great machine of propagandist Marxist, the television. Many of our good nationalists have wavered in the past because of family and the lack of support from that source. Today I'm having a small thought on the possible results of that lack which is holding the main nationalist party, the British National Party, back. We can blame the media, the authorities, education, in fact virtually everything, that makes our world in the UK what it is, a magnet for people who want to live like us, supposedly in a free society. But it is the electorate, the sheeples, the ordinary man in the street, who, as we are a party, trying to help. Now, speaking on a personal level, I know what it's like to have no support from one's progeny. In fact, no support should read absolute antipathy, which, coupled with the ignorance of our party manifesto, breeds a dislike which we do not deserve as a people, members or supporters of the British National Party. You might have been a fairly good parent or a good worker in a firm, but the minute you adopt the nationalist stance, you are pilloried and made to suffer for your views, even though many people have views much harsher than ours. They don't show their heads above the parapet. I'm not complaining, I'm a big girl, I can look after myself, but many of our people join the party to make life different for those they love in the future, and this point is completely ignored by our enemies, which are legion. We are the selfish ones, the bigoted ones and the racist ones. These slogans sit very happily on their tongues, but what are they, these people that seek to replace us with what? Hypocrites springs to mind, or even more so, village idiots. 
Do they think for one minute that it's fun to be harangued, vilified, or the alternative ignored, and put into a subhuman category for loving one's country and being worried about the future? The old ethos about killing the messenger is working and living in the UK now amongst us and the powers that be. In fact, the first of the mould into the cheese were the splinter groups that formed almost overnight with various semi-nationalist names, but none with the apparently toxic connotation of BNP. Of course, the truth of the matter is, if you take the nationalist creed, take some words out, put it with liberal outspeaks, what do you get? You do not get a truly nationalist party, you get UKIP, who are in truth, although thought to be Middle England's nationalist dream, aren't. In no way is Farage and his band of very well-paid henchmen remotely nationalist. In fact, they should not be against the EU because it is the EU and our government who give them huge amounts of money to split the vote, especially in the softer target areas like the southeast and southwest regions of the country, where the term frightened to think comes to mind. Many of our people who have to take breaks because of their families and the pressures that are brought down on them might be the first in line when our country alters beyond recognition. Some members of my family who, for no other reason than they have read or heard of our party, try to dissuade me from doing my job, could be first in line if this country ever becomes a caliphate or an Eastern European hellhole. They and other people don't seem to realise that we do not persevere for our health, but for what we know will happen if we do not at least try to save our country. Don't they realise if the worst happens, they won't count. Their children will not count, and their way of life, which they seem to be trying to preserve, will not count. I know that history favours the victors, and that when on the butt end of bad news, people generally either do something about it or hide. And in this case, in the UK, hiding seems to be preferable. But do they wonder exactly what would happen if the economy collapsed, if China invaded, if Sharia law and the way of Islam was a permanent feature in the UK. Now, I'm not saying these things will all happen, but life does not stand still and everything moves, however slowly. And in the face of what is happening in this country now, this move is getting quicker, aided by ignorance and bigotry, and that isn't from the British National Party. My main point is that whilst the people we're trying to help turn on us, what do they think of as an alternative? Everything is political. You buy food, it's political. You live and work in a country, it's political. Everything is based on politics and how people in power think we should live. If you do not do politics, you do not do anything. A news item caught my eye today and all school children should see it and all their parents because this is the way we're heading. Bus passenger beaten for asking Trio to stop pressing a bell. Three young black men turned on and violently attacked a 39-year-old London bus passenger simply for asking them to stop pressing the bell. The traumatised 39-year-old, who was knocked out in the beating, described how the young men attacked him and tried to drag him off the bus to finish him off. Not one of the passengers on the bus came to his assistance. Now that is what worries me. No one came to his assistance. Why? Fear. And that is what we in this party are up against. Fear. And there are none so frightened as those people who ignore what is going on and think that by ignoring it, it will go away. It will not. An Englishman's home is his castle, used to be the saying. I think it is now his prison, with his TV propaganda and his booze and the rest of the country, and often family and friends, shut out. He thinks he can revile those trying to help, he can resign his activism, become our enemy, have epiphanies all over the place, but when the time comes to stop straddling the fence of the middleman, how do you think he will react? In many countries the national character is such as they will react in a positive fashion, but with us? I'm not so sure. How much does it take to turn cowards into citizens who think about something other than the next TV programme or what they can shovel into their mouths or pour down their throats? I am of the opinion that for these people, there is no hope. They wouldn't know a good thing if it stood up in front of them, because they've been so brainwashed in the Marxist ethos since the last war. They are truly the puppets on a string. So I say to our activists, keep on the fight, despite all the personal trouble it may bring, because the alternative, for your families and loved ones, doesn't bear thinking about. And finally, 
On a lighter note for the weekend, ladies, you will understand this one, and although I have never been to a ladies' night of half or fully naked guys, this is for you gals who have. When advertising this show at the Baltic Inn in Ponty Yates near Lanethley in South Wales, Fabio, the popular heartthrob, was said to be made of pure muscle and the posters showed off his Mediterranean looks and toned physique. <laughs> As the lights went down, more than 150 women who had paid £10 a head whispered to each other and giggled as the anticipation mounted. However, Fabio had cancelled at the last minute and his replacement, scruffy novice Leon Bogoski, strode out onto the stage. There ensued a deathly silence and the girls looked at each other in horror. He looked like he'd just come off the street. He looked dirty, he was unshaven, and he didn't have a six-pack, said Deborah Jones, the compere. He was diabolical. He was disgusting. He just didn't have anything. No music, no dance routine. In fact, he looked like he'd been hit in the face with a wok. He just wasn't the sort of person you wanted to see take their kit off. Rather than begin his routine, things deteriorated to such an extent... Five police cars were sent to break up the scuffle and Cardiff-based Cardiff Leon was arrested on suspicion of assault. Viv Davis, who was own country in for seven years, said the stand-in stripper was unlikely to get further bookings. This presenter says, in one way, I feel sorry for him as he was obviously not used to being confronted by a horde of ravening women, but he should not have been placed in that position and neither, if I had paid to see Fabio, would I. You've been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozart, and I and the team at World at Eight and Radio Britain wish you all a very happy and a very safe weekend.